Good evening, everyone. Greetings. Come on in. Good to see you here on the Bible study night on this last day of February. I am delighted to be with you all one more time as persons are still coming in. We're going to open with the word of prayer in just a moment. Before we do so, I just want to make one announcement, and that is we are still... Um, collecting donations for the 400 students in Africa. We are just about there. We needed to get uh, 400 Bibles at $5 each, which is a total of about $2,000. So thank all of you that have contributed. We appreciate it so very, very, very much. We're going to be collecting through the end of March of 2023, and we will certainly make a tally total available to the church. We appreciate you so much. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you right now for another night. Thank you for bringing us through the day. Thank you for bringing us to this time of prayer and study. Be with us now as we pray, as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And before we get started, visitors, if you would like to join in with us in our prayer conference call, immediately following, immediately following our Bible study, there's a prayer conference call that you are invited to be a part of. The number is 667-770-7700. I'll give you the number one more time, 667-770-1295. And here is the code. The code is 547039-POUND. I'll give you the code one more time, 547039-POUND. Please, please join us with our prayer conference call and if you have a special prayer request we want you to know that we're praying for you 
You can go to our website, rcgministries.org, and there you'll find a place where you can submit a prayer request. We certainly want to be in prayer for your concerns. We are continuing to pray for the Smooth family and the homegoing celebration of Deacon James Allen Smooth, Chairman Emeritus of our Deacon Board at the church where he served in various capacities over 40 years. We're praying for the Smooth family. Thank all of you for your prayers and cards. Tonight we want to look at um, a topic, and this is, an, this is a change. I sent out one study relating to um, the events leading up to Mardi Gras and how Mardi Gras turns into Fat Tuesday, which places us into Lent, which is where we are right now. So I sent you that information. You can take a look at that. But I was led in the later hours of the day to look at um, demonic strongholds. Strongholds, demonic strongholds. We had a great service on Sunday, and after our service, we began to pray for the people of God. And we want people to know that this is time where Satan is really, really making himself known, particularly in the body of Christ. We want to talk about this for the month of March, demonic strongholds. We want to talk about angelology where demons came from, the hierarchy of demons, the demons function, their purpose, their strategies, even their names. So we're gonna talk about that because if we are aware, we can be in a better position to arm ourselves against them. If you have your Bibles tonight or your devices, turn to Galatians chapter five, verse 20. Galatians chapter five, verse 20. And, um, Actually, verse 19. Now I'm going to read it. Um, Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to begin at verse uh, 19. And it says, For the works of the flesh are well known, which are these, adultery, impurity, and lasciviousness. Verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, stubbornness, seditions, heresies, verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and all such things, those who practice these things, as I have told you before, I say to you now, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what I just read, and you can make a note, these are actually evidences of demonic strongholds that they're calling out here in Galatians. Because when we look at what we are faced with, many of us have been or are in some sort of demonic stronghold. That doesn't mean we're evil. It doesn't mean we're not Christian. It doesn't mean that we're weak. It just means that Satan is always after the believer, trying to hold us tight so that we cannot give God the glory. So, um, a stronghold, just one minute, just one minute. So a stronghold, a stronghold, and you got to put it in this light, a stronghold is a forceful argument, a rationale, an opinion, an idea and or a philosophy that is formed and it is resistant to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, a stronghold is something 
that resists the knowledge of Christ. So, having said that, and I just want that to sink in a minute, it's a stronghold, and it's within us, that resists the leading of the Lord and the following. Now, 2 Corinthians, you might want to write this down, chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, our weapons are not flesh and blood. We don't fight against each other. It's a spiritual warfare, but mighty <clears throat> through God to the pulling down, the pulling down, overthrowing and, dis and destroying of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought of the obedience of Christ. Now, that which is outlined in Galatians chapter 19, 20, 21, how it's listing all of those uh, demonic actions, if you will, many times those words in Galatians are used to come against people and we look at those words and say, hmm, you fall in that category, so you really are not saved, blah, 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 blah. So we're not going to use uh, Gal um, Galatians 19, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. We're not using those to target people. And we're not going to use those to drag persons down. We're not going to use those to uh, uh, show our level of self righteousness. We're not going to. We're not going to do that. But we're going to look at why and how these persons are, as they are described in Galatians chapter five, verses nineteen through twenty-one. So a spiritual bondage is a stronghold. It's a stronghold. It's fortified through the idea of holding something captive. So I'm, I'm talking about the noun of a stronghold. It's a stronghold, picture of brick wall, fence. Uh, it's not penetrable. And a stronghold is something that keeps everything inside and not letting persons in come out. It's like a castle. It's like a fortress. Some of our arguments are stubborn and some of our arguments are fortress. And some people, you ever try to talk to somebody, no matter what you say, they just fight back and they never listen. We call them stubborn. Well, that's a type of stronghold where they resist anything you say and always have an answer to justify their non-spiritual position. So... The arguments, and I'm just kind of go slow here because we talk about strongholds. It's arguments. Persons have a very strong opinion against God. It's reasonings against God. It's opinions, ideologies, philosophies, rationales that are contrary and diametrically opposed to the knowledge of Christ. So therefore they are satanic. They are satanic. We gotta be aware, saints. Now first of all, we've got to know our spiritual enemy. The enemy are not drugs. Drugs, drugs are not the enemy drugs, uh, chemical dependent, that, that's not the enemy. Alcoholism and things we can see, they're not the enemy. They are just symptoms 
of what the enemy is doing. You see, the enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not people. And sometimes we ought not argue and fight with people. That's why I say our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not people. But it's a spiritual warfare. It's, it's a spiritual warfare. So we got to know the enemy. So because somebody may be acting strong and what we see and how they're acting is offensive to us, always realize it's not the person. It's the spiritual warfare and what we see is the evidence of what's on the inside of them. Then secondly, we've got to know how to defeat the spiritual enemy. Spiritual breakthrough. How do you break through a castle? How do you break through a fortress? Because if you think of a fortress or a castle, right? Look at this. You've seen on TVs where they have the castle and there are persons on top of the castle and they're firing arrows or weapons down to the persons on the outside that's trying to come inside. What Satan is, he is on the fortress wall. He is on the castle wall. And on the inside of the castle wall are the persons and the spirits that he has held captive. So he's on the top of the wall and he's firing darts, arrows. Talk about the fiery darts. He's firing those at the people of God who's trying to break into the fortress to set captives free. That's why our witness is so strong, but it's also dangerous if you're not armed to fight the enemy. So our spiritual enemy is spiritual warfare. We got to know how to defeat the enemy. And then we might, we've got to have the right weapons. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is victory in the name of Jesus. So some battles we just can't fight. Some of the folk that argue won't hear the word of God are stubborn to the Bible and won't listen to you and you, we get discouraged. We've got to turn those battles over to the Lord. And we have to identify what those demons are. So the next time somebody really gets on your last nerve, bothering you, don't get mad at them. Pray about it, look them dead in the eye and say, demon in the name of Jesus and call out the demon that's on the inside. And you know the demon by the evidence of their actions and what they say. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. But we as believers have to be bold enough. And we have to be word strong. We can't be spiritual chumps. We gotta fight and we gotta let the demons know that we know who you are. You got a runaway situation, you got a situation on your job where you can't go up to your superior and start laying him out in Jesus' name. <laughs> but you can look at them and then speak to that spirit in your spirit, and you can call out that demon in the name of Jesus. You're going into a meeting, you can pray that God will arrest every spirit, every adversary, everything that's planned against you before you go into the meeting. You can walk in that meeting knowing that God has already prepared the way. So in this Lenten season, we want to talk about how can we break these 
strongholds. We see them in our children. We see them in our teenagers. And sometimes we just look at what they're going through. Oh, they're just teenagers. Oh, they just, it'll be all right for a while. And then we have sicknesses. We have other things that they're going through. They're all demonic driven. I know the evidence is the medical condition, but God came to heal and deliver us. But we're going to talk about that in a second. So what is the origin? What is the beginning of the strongholds? How did it all start? Well, we, we know what they says, what it is in Genesis. But look at Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, in the New Testament, we have the beginning of the strongholds outlined by Paul in the New Testament. You know what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20? Look what it says. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been so that men are without excuse. What he's saying right there is, we know better. From the beginning, his plan was laid out. And this is where in verse 21 we read, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Look at verse 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They were without excuse. We knew. But look at verse 23 and exchange the glory of the immortal God for the images to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, they begin to build creatures and they begin to worship the creatures that they built rather than the creation. I'm just going to go through for you because this is the beginning of these Demonic spirits that are released to us and is given to us from the beginning right here. In verse 21, or verse 23, and have exchanged the immortal for images made to look like what well, we just read, that mortal birds and reptiles. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Sometimes this chapter is very difficult for believers because persons use this text to attack persons for whatever the reason you can figure it out. But God tells us in this text before it begins, hey, listen, from the beginning, God was who he was. But we drifted. We, may, we drifted away. God didn't move. Mankind move. In verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. This is pure Bible. There's no argument. There's no, um, there's nothing, my opinions, my theology, nothing. This is just right the word. And this is the part of the word that people, we don't really want to hear because it cuts real close. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. God said it, but we don't believe it. And, look, and they worshiped and served created things 
rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. So this is telling us as it go real slow. We have substituted things and we've worshipped things rather than worship God. So you see, first he's talking about animals, he's talking about statues. This is before he gets into the real stuff. He says, look at verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. And this is where it gets really, and this is where this passage, where this new laws that are passed, and often I say the laws have made legal what God speaks against. Now, I am aware of gender confusion. I am aware of the medical challenges of persons that may be involved in a in a sexual identity crisis, there are medical evidences that some persons, and I might get in hot water, because when we are born, everyone is born in the womb as a female, and they develop in the womb before they are born into the species that they shall be. You can check that out. Now, I'm not going to get into all the reasons why it's gotten to where it is today, but I'm just throwing that out so we can be aware as believers. Gave them over to shameful lust. You see, even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. And I'm going to go on a limb again. A lot of this stuff is learned behavior. I'll leave it alone. Look at verse 27. In the same way, the men also abandon natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. This is the Bible talking. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received into themselves. You kind of get that in a minute. And received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Hence all of these sexual diseases and other things that we know about. This is strictly Bible. Don't get mad. This is, this is it. Look at verse 28. Therefore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a deprived, King James has reprobate mind, to do what ought not to be done. In other words, you don't want to listen, you don't want to obey, you don't want to trust God, then just have at it. <clears throat> and we can be careful sometimes. We have to be careful. <clears throat> I believe God can sometimes say, okay, go ahead. Now, since God has turned them over to a reprobate mind, they feel that what they're doing is correct and they are blaming God for the mistake that he made, this is what they say, and they are correcting it, is what they say. I'm just trying to be real careful. We're not trying to offend anyone. I'm just going with the word of God. But I gave us a way out. I do know that many of these situations are developed from the womb. We understand that. But I'm saying a lot of this stuff is learned because it says so right there. They worship and then they begin to go after the same sex. Look at 28. 
Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God and read it again, he gave them over to deprive a reprobate mind to do what ought to be done. Verse 29, they have become filled with all kinds of wickedness. Now we've got to read these words because these are the demons that we're going <clears throat> to talk about. Uh -huh. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, and they are gossipers. Right there in 129 of Romans, we're going to look at because each one of them are a type of demon that's been released into these persons that don't honor God and have turned their back on him. Look at verse 30. That's another. Slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Look, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Oh, they disobey their parents. Parents, we need to listen to this. Your child disobedient is not that the flesh and blood, they are indwelled by some of this demonic activity because they're not listening to the word of God. And as a believer, we have to continue to put their word in them, whether they like it or not. We got to keep on doing it. Because if they don't get it from us, where are they going to get it? And then when they get into a situation where they're just so far strung out, then we run to God, which is fine. But did we do our part early and now? And now we still have to tell them about the word of God, whether they like it or not. Verse 31, they are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. These are the people and these are the demons that are now coming forward that's operating in these persons. Now, let me back up a minute. Now, we are all believers. We are not exempt from demons trying to attract our old nature and take up residence and have and want to be control of us. But you see, as a believer, I'm going to get ahead of the story, we have weapons that we can use to defeat the demons. And we're going to talk about that. And the unbeliever doesn't have those weapons. Look at verse 32. All they, they, although they knew God's Righteous decree that those who do such things, look, deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You weren't doing it, but you hang around people that do. The Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. I guess we could be bad parents if we sat down with our children and read this chapter to them and let them see where they are in the light of God's word. Verse chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse. Who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other. You are also condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. That's heavy. In other words. We got to be careful how we judge them. Because we sometimes are doing the same thing under cover and secret that they are doing. Now I've read that passage in Romans because what it does, it sets the stage for 
demons to be released because he said it there. Turning you over to the reprobate mind. You didn't listen to me? Okay, have at it. Then he lists all the demons that's now available into the persons that disobey and reject him. Wrath. Wrath. W-R-A-T-H. Wrath is anger in motion. So, anger is a stronghold because the wrath is anger in motion. So let me get back to our lesson quickly because, oh my God, it's almost 720. But that's okay. We're going to continue this because this is important. Anything that opposes Christ is from the enemy, the devil. Strongholds are from Satan and his demonic hosts. Strongholds are not so resilient that they require weapons in order to combat them. You see, strongholds are not things that we can talk down. We can't negotiate with a stronghold. They don't go away with time. Spiritual strongholds will not be complained away. We can't keep complaining. I wish they'd leave me alone. Strongholds don't self-destruct. They must be destroyed, must be brought down, must be uh, liberated and demolished one by one, which God gives us the power to deal with strongholds. Ooh. There are many stronghold types. And as we said before, drugs. Drugs are not a, a demon. It's, it's really a, a, a social issue, but it, it, it's really an... Um, an outward expression of what's going on on the inside. And it's just, well, we'll get to that in a minute. And because it's a spiritual thing, we can't fight them with carnal things or fleshly things. We can't fuss and scream. We can't lock them up and put them away. I mean, we have to do something to correct them. But the real solution is to deal with the demon and do battle, spiritual battle, against the demon spirits that exist. And we only can do it with the Spirit of God. We got to know the demon in order to destroy his stronghold. You heard this before in Acts in Acts chapter 19, I'll just go through it real fast. There were some people going out and they approached persons, or a person that was demon possessed. And these persons in scripture had been hanging around the church, hanging around Jesus. And these persons went up to this man, or this, I think it was a man, and they wanted to exorcist. They want the demon to come out of the man. Well, you know, demons got a little sense. The demon spoke through the man, and he says, wait a second. Jesus, we know. Paul, we know. But who in the world are you? Persons were perpetrating, pretending to have the power. And when you read Acts 19, the demons that were in the man jumped on these persons. So I said that to say, we begin to speak to these demons. <clears throat> we have to make sure that we are armed with the word of God, not with our intellect, not with our theology, not with our maturity. We can only fight demons spiritually. Not only must we know who they are, but we must also identify 
what their game is. And I'm going to just do a couple of these. We'll get back on next week. You know, demons, for instance, I got a... Demons are in groupings. And we're going to talk about that. So, one, one demonic grouping, cluster, one is bitterness. So, bitterness is a demon. Now, under bitterness, there's some little imps under that demon of bitterness. So, you got the demon of bitterness. That's the big one there. Then you got all these little diminutives, all these little things. So, under bitterness is the demon of blaming somebody else all the time. It's the demon of complaining all the time. It's the demon of critical judging persons. It's the demon of gossiping. It's the demon of murmuring. It's the demon of ridicule. It's the demon of unforgiveness. It's the demon of irrational condemnation. So we have to recognize if somebody falls in that category, they're under the control of the demon of bitterness, even though it shows up as blaming, complaining, critical judging, always judging somebody, don't have any facts, gossiping, murmuring, ridicule, unforgiveness, and irrational condemnation for no reason at all. You're just going to condemn somebody. So that's just one cluster. That's, and, and that heading of bitterness, there's a demon of bitterness that's assigned to whomever's available to receive this demon of bitterness and takes in that person whatever level they need to take. And then the person, as a believer, we then have to struggle. God, help me to overcome my attitude of blaming, complaining, gossiping. You see how that works? So even though we're believers, that doesn't stop Satan from trying to come in and take charge. And as a believer, we have to fight with the weapons of our spiritual warfare. But unbelievers don't have that. And I'm going to do one more. We talk about identifying who these demons are. The major category would be depression. Depression. All of us get depressed at times. I, 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 I get depressed. I mean, I'm not the depressed of I'm going to commit suicide. Maybe I should say, maybe we get discouraged. Is that a better way of saying it? I get discouraged. So under the demonic heading of depression, Satan will use discouragement. He'll use despair. He will use hopelessness. I'm useless. What's the use? He will use despondency, self-pity, insomnia, all I want to do is sleep to get away from everybody. Suicidal thoughts. Withdrawal from others. And also feeling alone. Those attributes come under the demon of depression. And it shows up in persons. Whoever will allow him or herself to be subject to this and don't have the spiritual warfare we're going to talk about or the spiritual weapon to defeat it, then they become a victim. And you think about it. That's why some people commit suicide, self-pity, go in a corner, don't want to be bothered, withdraw from other people, always discouraged, no joy, in despair. Those persons need to have prayer and that demon need to be dealt with by name. That's it for tonight. 728, we're going to come back next week. A lot, a lot more to do this. And think about what was read tonight, what was said. All of it there is in scripture. And if you have some errors in your life that you need special prayer for, 
join our prayer call, we want to make sure we pray for you. Now, even though we listed all those categories, and if you fall in one of those ones, don't become discouraged. Don't think that you're falling apart. Don't think Satan and you're going to go to hell. No, it just means that Satan is doing his job to attack a believer. But God don't leave us defenseless. He's give us spiritual weapons where we can fight against the darts and spears. He might be up on the castle trying to keep us away, but we've got weapons. When he throws it, we got a shield. We're going to talk about that. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. God is faithful. Be with us on uh, next Tuesday. We're going to continue this series on strongholds. We want to try to get person to see God is able to deliver. Father God, bless tonight. Thank you for allowing us to study this message. Give us clarity. Help us to think about this as we leave this session tonight. Help us, fortify us, take us to scripture. Give us the weapons that we need to defeat Satan and his imps. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you right now. Be with us, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, people of God. Our prayer call starts right now.